Science and Human Origins, Objections, Part 2. We've been discussing the book Science and Human Origins uh, by Gauger, Axe, and Luskin, uh, put out by the Discovery Institute Press. Um, the chapters have been Science and Human Origin and Darwin's Little Engine that couldn't, both arguing that uh, evolution could not have gotten from apes to humans. Um, and we discussed the objections to that last week. Uh, we've been uh, looking at, uh, we're looking at Human Origins in the Fossil Record by Casey Luskin. That's the chapter we'll be particularly looking at now. And then later on, chapter on DNA, uh, again by Luskin. And then finally, The Science of Adam and Eve. And of course, the book t tells you about the authors. Right now, we're going to leave that off as we've already been through that a couple of times. Um, the book itself is available on the web for free, um, which came in very handy when I was transcribing passages from the book. You just cut and paste. The uh, book has been, uh, at least an attempt at debunking has been done by uh, somebody by the name of Paul McBride. And uh, that's the blurb from uh, Rational Wiki. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, the objections to chapter one are actually found, one in association, but another one that's not actually in association. You have to kind of look for it if you're going to find it. Um, the chapter two, to chapter three, which is the one we'll be concentrating now, to chapter four, and to chapter five. And there's one other one that oh, I'll put up when we come to it uh, that. Uh, We'll give you uh, where we're looking uh, at chapter three in particular, one small feature of it. Um, I'm indebted to uh, Jeff Sonnentag for uh, pointing me to some of these uh, 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 websites. Uh, and he's indebted to somebody by the name of Iga Kuse, who replied to where he had posted uh, the talks we were giving on uh, uh, the book itself. And Igakusi's note reads, here are some actual evolutionary biologists. Here's some ev actual evolutionary biologists, a little snark there. Also go through the book chapter by chapter. And Efferensis uh, uh, actually has something on uh, chapter three that's, I don't think this is the right one. I think that uh, that one has to do with chapter one, but um, but there's one on chapter three that's worth uh, commenting on uh, that we'll come to. And then also this one, uh, Apomorph, uh, this is just uh, McBride's review. And um, as I would say, is this a cherry pick critique? Well, if so, it wasn't by me, it was by Igakusi. And the comments in the book by Ad Rational Wiki um, tell about the book itself <coughs> and then tell its reception. And uh, this is, of course, referring to science and human origins. Um, it is an anti-science book and has received negative reviews from scientists pushing for a religious agenda. The sole purpose of the book was an attempt to try and prove Adam and Eve existed. The book has been debunked chapter by chapter in a lengthy online review by Auckland University of Technology PhD candidate Paul McBride. Uh, quick comment on received, I just simply put it there because that's the way they put it up. Everybody makes mistakes on the internet. Um, if they make too much of your mistakes, uh, they're probably being nitpicking. And I refuse to nitpick on this. Um, and. Uh, Notice that he's a candidate. He hasn't written a lot about anything else, as far as I can tell. There's, I think there's a couple of peer-reviewed articles. Um, uh, I'm not saying that he should not be listened to. But I am saying that if you get people that say, oh, this person doesn't know what he's talking about because uh, he doesn't have the right training, um, 
That's a quick and dirty way to make people shut up because they, uh, uh, they're going to rule them out, but they're not going to rule their own people out. So that kind of comment should be at least partially ignored. Uh, the fact of the matter is that anybody can do this. And everybody's in training at some time. Um, McBride's comments start out by saying Luskin must be something of a polymath. Of course, that's a little dig at uh, Luskin doesn't know what he's doing. Um, he never got a PhD in evolutionary biology. Actually, I think he doesn't have a PhD, period. He does have a PhD, uh, an MA in science and, an, and I think a, a, a law degree. Um, Luskin's confidence seems to stem from his observation that anthropologists say one thing to the public and another behind closed doors, uh, the closed door of the peer review literature. The tantalizing possibility of conspiracy. Uh, however, personally, I know a few dis uh, disciplines where scientists address technical controversies in the public arena. Agreement comes to the fore in the public arena because, to a large extent, the agreed upon basics are discussed there. Perhaps there is a less sinister cause of such differences. Um, I don't think that Luskin would say that it was paranoia or conspiracy, but more of a, um, more of a shared viewpoint. Um, <coughs> and uh, a determination that certain things are true and therefore can't be questioned. Um, and one of them is that uh, uh, people did come from apes, if you go back far enough. I just, uh, I, my view is that, you know, the evolutionary biologist are all pretty well convinced that we came from apes and uh, we just disagree on how and so therefore we'll all stay with one voice that we came from, from apes but uh, we'll discuss among ourselves how and uh, that's something that's confusing to everybody so why bring it up to the front? Um, although occasionally that kind of stuff leaks into the public view as well where you'll have a new finding and somebody will be trumpeting it and other people will be saying calm down this is uh, not uh, uh, the end of all the discussion. Luskin, uh, this is again going back to McBride. Luskin is right to point out that the hominin fossil record is imperfect and that at times the completeness of that record have been overstated. But he goes further and channels Lewontin to make a strange claim. So fragmentary and disconnected is the data. This is him quoting Luskin, of course that in the judgment of Harvard zoologist Richard Lewontin, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestor. That's quite an uh, impressive uh, comment. It does seem to be, if you're legally trained, and Luskin is, a kind of an admission against interest. It is not a sign, now this is back to McBride, and he's saying, no, no, Luskin's got it wrong. It is not a sign of the poverty of a fossil record that extant species lack directly fossilized ancestors, but rather evidence that there are various diverse lineages that mostly led to evolutionary dead ends. I think that um, the way uh, uh, Gould would put it is that evolution gives you a bush, and so there are lots of side Roads. This is a case for hominomy as it is for other lineages. We have no particular reason to expect to find direct ancestors of living species in the fossil record. And of course, there will be appropriate controversy for any given fossil because of how different characters will be interpreted. It's a mess, in other words, and it can be expected to be a mess. And so I think this is an agreement by McBride and by many other people who are reading him and saying, yeah, that's a good review, uh, that in fact what we do, we do not have a nice clean apes, half apes, half humans, three quarters apes, three, uh, or three quarters humans, 
one quarter ape, and then finally to full-blown humans, that it isn't quite that simple. Um, for the most part, Luskin does a fine job of pointing out, of pointing to all the scientific controversy around different fossils, uncertainties of placement, the effect of the placement of one fossil on the placement of others, and so forth. He doesn't spend a lot of time balancing this with broad agreement formed in literature on the fossils, preferring to emphasize dissent. Um, <coughs> so in other words, his points are valid, it's just that he doesn't say that everybody thinks that there's common dissent. Um, again, this is the Reader's Digest version. If you want to check the full thing, you can. Um, and then he makes a comment that's kind of interesting. Teaching the controversy should require first teaching the orthodoxy. If you go back to the chapter, you'll notice that he does teach that here is the kind of quasi-generally agreed on um, uh, standard and then goes th through and critiques it. Um, I think what he wants Luskin to do is to present something like a full textbook uh, description, which of course means that you can't make your points in, in a very short time and means that nobody would read it because it would be 500 pages long. Um, but instead of focusing on the important characteristics that lead paleoanthropologists to this conclusion, her knee, for example, uh, might have been a useful discussion point, her pelvis, the additional evidence of bipedality from a more recent fossil find. This is, um, this is McBride again commenting on his treatment of Lucy, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. Um, he focuses on the personal side, painting a picture of dishonest science instead. When the evidence, and then he quotes uh, Science and Human Origins again, when the evidence points against Lucy being bipedal, it is simply discarded. But the main motivation for this dismissal is the evolutionary belief that modern humans need fully bipedal an ape-like ancestors. Um, I guess you can read conspiracy into that. I would read more claims of bias. But yeah. your mileage may vary on that. So it is speculation about bias and not the characters of the, uh, characters of the fossils that Luskin purports to be the driving force in anthropological interpretations here. Something he set the reader up to accept earlier by emphasizing how personal disputes in this area can get. And uh, McBride's aside, true, but which discipline could claim to have no personal disputes? Um, beyond this, there would be a thousand people better qualified than I to comment on the Australopithecines further, and I will leave it to them to do so. Well, actually, I'm pleased that at least he acknowledges that his knowledge isn't that good, and therefore you have to be, uh, I mean, I agree, it's, it is passing the buck, but uh, I think it's appropriate to pass the buck when you don't know. Right, and it's also Just a minute. We want to preserve this. <laughs> it's appropriate to say when you don't know, but it then how then can you give a critique? about something you don't know. And you admittedly don't know, but oh, well, I'm sure somebody else has known. Well, why don't you let them give the critique? Since all the best you can tell me is that you don't know. Well, that is true. And um, that's one of the kind of interesting things. Uh, Rational Wiki says this is, uh, I don't know if it says it's the best, but it seems to imply that it is a thorough job. Obviously, it's not quite as thorough as it could be. Um, so apparently it, it there's... It can't be a thorough job since he agrees with all the points made by Luskin and the points he doesn't agree with, he says, I don't know, but somebody else probably does. Well, you know, and, and what I see, the, the other thing that I see is this kind of shading into conspiracy like uh, 
Johansson and Leakey and uh, several other people all got into a room and said, what are we going to do with this? Uh, well, let's do it this way. And as far as the knee joint and all that other stuff, I mean, there's been plenty of discussion on that. And I don't even know why he brought it up, because the knee joint doesn't help him at all. And neither does the pelvis or anything else about Lucy. It, it, so, it and, he doesn't, and he doesn't bring up Spore's argument about the semicircular canals, so he, he does the same thing Luskin does, is skip those things he doesn't want to talk about. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, and that's, that's one of the interesting things. Is that I, I, I guess if we're going to be having a discussion, it's probably a good idea to uh, have everybody, uh, if you're going to cover the points, you need to cover them all. And it's probably a good idea to say, you know, he has a few a point here and a point there, and I'm not going to disagree with them. And I would look at things slightly differently. But if uh, that's all you're going to do, then you're really not saying a whole lot. Um, but there's, there's more to the discussion. Uh, and then he's going to move on here, and he's going to say, even though Luskin complains, this is again McBride, even though Luskin complains of a poor hominin fossil record, and of course there are stretches where it is poor, there are multiple Homo erectus fossils that should probably be italicized, and that's my fault, uh, the transfer process. And um, substantial evidence of greatly increasing cranial capacity over time. In fact, this is a key part of why some workers split some of the later Homo erectus specimens into different species. Homo heidelbergensis. Whether we accept this or whether we prefer to lump them as one species, it is clear that there is important variation in cranial capacity from early to late Homo erectus. Early Homo erectus have consistently smaller cranial volumes than those dated to the last couple hundred thousand years. The average cranial volume of early Georgian Homo erectus, dating to about 1.7 million years ago, is 700 cc's. And then he refers to a paper. Luskin's source does not even acknowledge such small sizes, given the lower bounds for Homo erectus is 850 cc's. And then uh, that finishes that part of it. Um, and he has an update. It says, fortuitous timing. Had to, to Google alerts. There's been there's just been a themed issue of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society B that deals with the evolution of cognition in humans. A paper in this issue by Schultz, Nelson, and Dunbar elegantly summarizes hominin cognitive evolution, showing a series of progressive and punctuated changes that culminate in the emergence of modern human language within the last 100,000 years. Brain size evolution of more than 3 million years is summarized. And there's the picture. Now, it's kind of interesting. They have this in log form. And for what it's worth, this would be 1,000 cc's. This would be 1,600 cc's, very close to it. Uh, this would be um, 800, no, yeah. 800, if I can get this, 875 cc's, and this would be uh, 750 cc's, if that helps you any. What's 3.2? Is it more than that? Uh, that's more than 1,000. Yeah, it's, it's about 1,600. And those ranges of errors there, they don't include pygmies or dwarfs or uh, midgets? No, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, if you were to do humans, you'd find that it went from about here to here, although that's range rather than standard deviation. Standard deviation is probably in a narrower. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I, I was able to look at the article, but I was not able to download it. And one of the things I was going to do Friday afternoon and didn't get to do was to download the article so that I could go over it piece by piece. And so I can't tell you. Um, this looks pretty impressive until you realize that uh, um, Homo erectus tends to be above Homo habilis and also above afarensis. And so you're actually looking at, uh, it's a very uh, interesting article that was done by, and 
this again, I, I'll try to bring the, the slides next week, was actually done by Nick Madsky, showing that it depends on how you want to look at this, uh, what it looks like. That is to say, out here, there is Homo erectus. Down here, for a considerable period of time, there is um, Australopithecus afarensis and Homo habilis, which tend to be mostly below the line. Which, if you're wondering why they draw the line at Homo habilis versus Homo erectus, that's why. Um, and uh, there does tend to be, with time, a movement of cranial capacity up. Um, but what would really be interesting is to see them plotted by the supposed species. Um, it's not quite as clear. Now, the next thing is you'll find that there are various people who argue about which species it is. And then now, if you start including their arguments, the picture gets all fuzzed up. So it depends on how you want to look at the data, what lessons you want to draw from it. And I'll try to bring that uh, data, um, uh, actually not from Nick, Ma Nick Madsky himself, but he got it from somebody else who summarized the literature and then put it into uh, uh, basically Excel form and points instead of, uh, instead of ranges like the like the article showed there. But brain size really has nothing to do with language capacity or intelligence or anything. Um, uh, it's, I mean, you have proportional dwarfism with brain, cranial capacities of 500 cc's or even 400 cc's, and they're, they have normal IQ. Um, there's, uh, and, and, and large chimpanzees still don't talk. Right, you have the giant gibbons that uh, originally were thought to be uh, human ancestors as well, with the skull cap and the human femur and all that, and their cranial capacity was over a thousand cc. So, what does it matter? Well, it it matters a little bit. Um, unfortunately, you can't measure language activity. What you can measure is skull capacity, and uh, unfortunately, we can't measure uh, brain case. Or, or brain arrangement, right. and so that makes it uh, that makes it difficult to. I guess one of the things I would say is that if you read Casey Leskin, you may come up with a slightly more optimistic picture than uh, than the real picture, at least as far as I can tell. However, in uh, uh, I will say that uh, I think his interpretation is consistent with the data. It's just. There are several different interpretations at this point that are consistent with the data. Um, and then uh, he says, uh, McBride says, I cordially invite Casey Luskin to readdress the issue of human evolution in this context. And uh, then there's a second update, which is from input from readers. Richard Hopp has kindly pointed out to me several posts by Nick Madsky addressing hominin cranial evolution. Uh, which is where I ran, uh, ran into it, and demonstrating the lack of a discontinuity that Luskin has claimed. And I'll try to get you that in very brief uh, points. Um, the breathtaking thing is Matsky's post here and here, which of course are places to click and they're linked, deals specifically with Luskin's claim back in 2006, as well as raw cranial capacity shows a temporal progression as a proportion of body mass. Yet six years later, a uh, typo that I didn't catch, um, Luskin's argument remains firm in the face of the evidence. He is still arguing in 2012 that there's a massive gap in the hominin fossil record that modern humans arrived with effectively modern brain capacity as Homo erectus. Now, I think that's a misstatement of Luskin's opinion. Uh, I don't think he would say that, it, well, I suppose he, if you say effectively modern, I, I think that he would say that they were on average smaller than the, than the average human today, but they were not, uh, I think that he would say that they were significantly above the average ape uh, capacity. And, uh, so I think that uh, McBride is, 
But, but that statement is correct. He shows pr temporal progression as proportion of body mass. That's what cranial capacity is related to, body mass. Yes. It's not really so much related to intelligence. It's related to body mass. If you're a bigger person, you'll have a bigger brain. Yes. But that, that doesn't mean you'll be any smarter. That is true. Um, although it's interesting because, because people do look up to people who are taller and think they're smarter. It's, uh, I, you know, uh, if, if you look at, if you look at uh, people who, have, uh, who wind up in political leadership, of course, that's not a, always a, an indication of intelligence either, but, uh, <coughs> but, uh, but tall people will do better. They look impressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, Saul and David. Uh, Saul was, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. A wonderful king. He can lead us. And the Im the implication is he's got to be smarter. And the fact of the matter is, of course, David was quite a bit smarter than small than Saul in a number of different ways. Certainly more gifted in terms of being able to play the harp. In terms of being able to hit small targets with a uh, with a stone from a long w distance away. Um, all kinds of uh, different ways, um, and and of course the, the spiritual development does not necessarily correlate with intelligence, uh, let alone with tallness. Yes, uh, doesn't Luskin point out that a number of authorities claim that Homo habilis is more like Australopithecines? That is true. Like a Homo erectus. Uh, well, in, in fact, you'd expect that. If Homo habilis is supposed to be in b intermediate between, uh, then you would expect it to be intermediate. And saying that it shades down closer towards aus Australopithecus would not be a, a, an earth-shaking statement for anybody to make. But that, that does emphasize a gap. Uh, it, yeah. it emphasizes that there is somewhat of a gap. And the problem that you'll have here is very simple. If you argue a gap, then you're arguing in a direction that can be taken advantage of by creationists. So there's a, there's a... But you shouldn't argue a gap based on brain size. Because there are monkeys that have larger brains than some humans, modern humans. And they're, you know, so there's really, it's bad to argue a gap based on brain size from the creationist perspective. You should argue a gap based on functionality, which is very fuzzy and I anything that we do have as far as standing upright or walking on knuckle rockers and all that makes a distinct line. That's, a, that's the best evidence that creationists have that there's a gap is based on uh, on, uh, on the walking thing. Yeah, on their walking thing. And now, that's the reason I suppose why uh, Australopithecus afarensis is affirmed by many uh, authorities to actually be <coughs> upright walkers because it's something that they think they can say from the bones rather than uh, uh, rather than whether they could speak or not, because you have no way of knowing whether they could well, speak. Just speak until they yeah, that's right. They did say Neanderthals couldn't speak in there. Uh, well, th they may or may not have spoken. We have no way of, of proving that one way or the other. But what we can <coughs> say is they had intelligent ideas and they could do artwork. And... Uh, uh, yeah. Here. Paul, well, they say they can we speak because they found the hyoid bone for Neanderthals. <coughs> but they had bigger brains and they, they had funeral services with flowers and burial rites and all that stuff. So they were obviously intelligent. So. Yeah. Uh, Paul, we, we can add to the picture here the fact average brain size. That it's, uh, uh, it's true, you know, that we got so much overlap here. But uh, the average brain size of Homo erectus is definitely bigger than the average size of the brain of Homo habilis. Well, that raises the question of how do you distinguish between the two, and do you distinguish them on the basis of brain size, in which case there is obviously a difference. Now, no, no, if you, you can say If you can say the <laughs> knuckle walkers had small brains, no. <laughs> then I think, that, I think that you could make a really good, clear case that there's a difference, the problem that I see well, is that in order to convince people on a basis other than I'm the expert and I've <coughs> looked at 500 fossils and this is what I think, 
which is not the way science is supposed to well, be done. There are just a very few Homo habilis fossils, you know. And, and this, is, this is what I see. This is the one unfortunate thing. If you're starting to look at this from a, it's tempting from a, a, a legal point of view to look for authorities. And the problem is in science there are no authorities. What you really need to do is you need to show, and here's a picture of, you know, and here you can see where the bone is. See, and you don't have to depend on me. You can see it for yourself. And that's one of the things that's really not easily accessible. Even if you do casts, the casts don't show, for example, where the teeth have been filed for Piltdown Man, but the original skull did. Uh, so we are left in a situation where we'd like to everybody be able to see for himself, where in fact you're kind of dependent on authorities. And it's a real mess. And science shouldn't be this way. And maybe one of the things that we're um, kind of saying in a roundabout way is this isn't, in a fundamental way, this isn't really science. Because what we're dealing with is competing authorities. Note that in the second link, Matsky shows it's Luskin's 2005 chromosomal fusion under separate ancestor GIF. Uh, the two frames of this appear effectively unchanged from his 2000 book chapter. Now this is actually off topic slightly because that was in chapter 4. This is in chapter 3. What he's trying to say is that Luskin doesn't change his mind when we think he ought to. Hopp would also like an explanation from Luskin of his omissions of Hennenberg and de Miguel, 2004, who conclude that there are no discontinuities throughout time or geographic latitude in hominin cranial evolution. Which is, of course, what they should conclude if uh, the politically correct uh, um, story is true. Um, so, uh, again, this is somebody arguing from authority instead of from uh, data or something that can be reasonably verified. In addition, if the hominin fossil record is so definitively problematic, there should be a testable alternative framework by which we can interpret what we find. And what is this alternative? Luskin does not propose one. I can only imagine we are meant to tacitly know the graceful hand of the intelligent designer was involved in our special creation, and the rest is mere detail. They're still mad at intelligent design by not putting out a big target that they can shoot at, which makes evolution defend itself rather than, uh, rather than be able to knock down the other guy. And this is a repeated theme. Well, who's the intelligent designer? And of course, you see, if you say what you think is the intelligent designer, then they're going to shoot that down. Well, the thing that they won't accept as an alternative is anything that has to do with intelligent design. Any alternative has to be naturalistic and mindless. A mindless, naturalistic mechanism, otherwise they will not consider it a viable alternative. If you say it must have been designed, then they say, well, design can explain anything and therefore nothing, so it's not a viable alternative. I've debated Maskey personally on this several times, and they'll say that's not an alternative. And Maskey personally says that because uh, you can't defend design because design can't be investigated scientifically, he would say. And uh, so that's why they, they say that, that there's no viable alternative. I think there's an even more fundamental um, reason that they do that, and that is this. Um, they know that if you concede design, it rapidly approaches a, a, uh, a personal god. It doesn't actually quite get there, but you're forced pretty, pretty rapidly to say, and well, then we could have a design for this, and a design for this, and a design for that. And that is something that's beyond what we humans can presently do. So we're talking to at least a superhuman design, if not a supernatural one. And uh, that starts to get them in very uncomfortable territory. And the reason I say that is because Richard Dawkins let the cat out of the bag in his interview with Ben Stein. 
Actually, they have no objection to intelligent design as long as it's naturalistic. And that's the key. Well, not it's design. not intelligent design they're against. It's naturalism not that, they have to, that they have to have. No, he only said that because he didn't, he didn't understand where this interview was going or that it would be published as part of a movie for intelligent design. That's the only reason he said that. They are against any form of intelligent design when you really put the tax to the wall. And you say, hey, this is evidence of intelligent design. They'll argue against any form, naturalistic or otherwise, alien. They don't care. Because they know that if they admit that some smart alien, p perhaps, created life on this planet and or its diversity, that pretty soon people will say, why not God? And well, no, and, and my, that is my point. They're, they're really not after intelligent design. Well, they're they after... They're after God. Right, but they know that if they admit intelligent design on any level, exactly. they'll, they'll let the divine foot in the door. Exactly. Yeah, and, that's the and, 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 and that's the point I'm making is this, that, that when they're in argumentative mode, <coughs> they have those two very carefully connected. When you catch them un unguarded, they will admit, well, yeah, actually, you know, it could be an intelligent alien they evolved... Uh, uh, you know, 10, 10 million years, uh, 10 billion years ago, whatever, you know, it could be. Uh, but, but they know that as soon as they do that, people are going to pin them to the wall. By, where did that alien come from? And at 15 billion years, the argument fails. Um, uh, and so that's really where that's coming from. And it's, it's spin. And, it, and Dawkins temporarily forgot the spin. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of studies on design. The problem is they're in scholarly areas that are very distant from biology as such. There are uh, entire schools of technology that are essentially almost entirely focused on design of structures, design of various functional features of all kinds of things, from wheels to bridges to buildings to all kinds of things. We have no problem with design, provided that we are the ones who are designing. And Actually, we can study it, we can study it to death, provided that we're the ones who are doing all the designing. Uh, and the, the irony, I would like to take this a little further, there was no problem with design in biology until Darwin became popular. There is still no problem with design in biology as long as it's disguised well enough. And let me explain. You find a protein in a particular animal and the first thing you ask is, what is it doing? Ah. Because it must be doing something. And, and we call it, uh, how should I say, protein engineering? We call sequence engineering, molecular engineering, things like this. We have no trouble with design, provided we're the ones doing it. Well, we have actually no problem with design in nature as long as you can say that it came about accidentally. Um, if God makes a molecule or something, this is not science. If man makes a exactly the same molecule, it's science. It tells you it should. Well, actually, I don't have too much trouble with that because if God makes it, he probably doesn't have to have a laboratory to do it. Well, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and uh, the interesting thing is if we look at what he's doing, it seems to be uh, uh, several steps above uh, what we can do, and the only reason I say several steps above is because we probably can't see some of those steps. Uh, most of the time it's many steps above. But um, now, <coughs> the comments mention something called Australopithecus sediba, which is, uh, or sediba, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, which has just recently been broadcast. and. I will just give you that Luskin does make a reply, and his, his reply seems to make uh, sense. And uh, there's the website. And uh, 
I was intending to put in a comment on Anton 2003 and also Schultz, Nelson, Dunbar 2012, but unfortunately time did not permit, so we will skip those. What I was able to find is the other guy that was referred to made at a point which I think is important and I think, I would like to believe otherwise, but I think that Luskin may be wrong here. Um, the uh, website is given there, and the, um, uh, it's hard to get the author's name off of the uh, page, but, uh, or at least if you're in a hurry. Uh, but uh, the, the chapter says Luskin Science and Human Origins and Dictic Feces, and I forgot to italicize Science and Human Origins, which is obviously a reference to the book. And I'm going to just go through a very short part of this. The rest of it is kind of standard stuff that uh, we've seen some of in McBride. Um, then Luskin moves on to Lucy and seems to be under the impression that Lucy is the only specimen of Australopithecus uh, afarensis, and I probably didn't re-italicize that. Uh, the process I use strips out italics, um, but a lot of other things that are useful that strip out. Um, along the way, he re recapitulates material I've looked at previously here, and that's a link, of course. Uh, he does add something new, which turns out to be a pretty good example of the in intellectual dishonesty Luskin is known for. Um, this guy obviously doesn't think too much of Luskin. Uh, here's where the dick dick feces hit the fan. Uh, that should be hit the fan, but that's okay. Um, <coughs> from Luskin and uh, the dick dick feces in case you're interested is apparently one of the places they dug this out for was a place where dick dicks came to um, relieve themselves uh, quite frequently so um, dick dicks are small antelopes for what it's worth um, from Luskin and this is of course quoting Luskin there are some reasons for skepticism over whether the bones of Lucy represent a single individual or even a single species. In a video playing at the exhibit, Lucy's discoverer, Donald Johansson, admitted that when he found the fossil, the bones were scattered across a hillside where he looked up the slope and there were other bones sticking out. Johnson's written account explains further how the bones were not found together. Since the fossil wasn't found in situ, it could have come from anywhere above. There's no matrix on any of the bones we found either. All you can do is make probability statements. Sounds like Johansson is talking about Lucy and Hadar and is admitting that they just guessed where AL2881 came from, right? Wrong. Now, if you go on AL2881, what's that? Obviously, it's a specimen and uh, uh, which, um, Unfortunately, these people sometimes write cryptically, and if you kind of know the field, you realize what they're talking about. But if you're uh, an average person who hasn't seen any of this, it gets confusing. Uh, the 66 in quote above is Luskin's footnote, which goes to Tim White, quoted in Lucy Johansson and James Shreve, Lucy's Child, The Discovery of a Human Ancestor, New York, Early Man Publishing, uh, page 163. In that is, by the way, the reference I was trying to get when I ran out of time. Uh, so it's not Johansson talking about Lucy at Hadar, even though Lucy uh, Luskin may get, made it sound like it was. It's Tim White talking about Lucy at Hadar, right? Wrong. If you go to page 163 of Lucy's Child, The Discovery of Human Ancestry, you will find that it is Tim White talking about OH62 at Olduvai Gorge. The night previous to White's statement, uh, Johansson, White, and Sua had found the first fragments of OH-62. The next day they returned to the area, which was also an area known as a dick dick latrine, uh, with a flock of scientists, students, and guests who began a proper examination and excavation of the site. White is quizzing a couple of grad students on how to proceed when he makes that comment. So rather than being a statement of ignorance about Lucy on the part of Johansson, it is just Luskin making up stuff, making stuff up in a blatant display of dishonest scholarship. 
Now, I would, I would like to see what the original material is. I, I think this is probably attributing to people motives that uh, we should be careful about attributing. Um, it's, it's easy to be mistaken and wrong rather than, uh, uh, rather than deliberately throwing things out. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you the definitive answer, and maybe some of our commentators have actually read that passage. Um, well, he is wrong about the Lucy skeleton. I, has he admitted this in public? Or? Uh, not that I have seen. Uh, that doesn't mean I've scanned everything that there is that he said, so I don't know for sure. But I'm going to take you in a slightly different but related uh, area. And that is uh, uh, something that is found on, I think it's Panda's thumb. Well, we'll see in a minute. Um, Lucy's knee joint, a case study in creationist willingness to admit their errors. And this is by Jim Lippert, and I forgot to put that. It's actually should be copyright in the next line. Uh, last update in 2003. And it's in Talk Origins. I take it back. It wasn't Panda's thumb, it was Talk Origins. Um, and there are two paragraphs that I'm going to read out of that whole thing. And uh, uh, creationists have been making the claim that Donald Johansson found the knee joint of Lucy, a 40% complete skeleton of the species Australopithecus afarensis, in a location, quote, 60 to 70 meters lower in the strata and two to three kilometers away. And that's apparently Willis made one of the first claims, as far as I can tell. They have sometimes gone on to add the claim that only under questioning did Johansson admit that the knee was found over a mile from Lucy. That this is the author saying that these people will claim that only under questioning did Johansson admit that the knee was found over a mile from Lucy. To the best of our knowledge, this admission has not appeared in print. And uh, Willis, 1987, and the emphasis is in the original. I also see oh, Brown, 1989, that's Walter Brown for what it's worth, um, page uh, 44. This, the claim is used by creationists to show that A, evolutionists are dishonest, and B, Lucy did not walk upright. It successfully shows neither of these things because it is false. Even if it were true, it would not demonstrate B, uh, for reasons given in the part, uh, obviously this guy's referencing his own stuff, the knee joint is not the only evidence of bipedality in Australopithecus afarensis. And then he goes through first showing it and giving actually a letter from Johansson which uh, states pretty clearly uh, what he was meaning when he made the statement that has been quoted. Um, to summarize, at least 18 creationists have, been, have made this bogus claim. Three have never responded in any way to questions about it. Another two have not responded to further inquiries. Only five have shown a willingness to discuss the matter, but one cut off correspondence. Four have agreed that the claim... Now, something's wrong here because only five have shown a willingness to discuss the matter. Actually, there's more than five, as we will see at the very last line. So take that only with a grain of salt. But one kind of correspondence. Four have agreed that the claim was an error and agreed to stop making it. Uh, interestingly enough, Hovind is one of those, um, who's usually been vilified as somebody who's uh, basically dishonest. It sounds like he is more honorable than some. And two have agreed to stop making it if further investigation showed the claim was bogus. Uh, but have continued to repeat it, so apparently they haven't been shown that the claim is bogus. One, Arntz has indicated a willingness to believe the claim is an error, but no interest in researching further or offering a correction, because the article in which he made the claim just used it as an example of a type of error in reasoning. Uh, although I would still, if I were doing it, I would want to, uh, to correct the error. One has insisted that the claim is not an error, but agreed to stop making it at the request of the Institute for Creation Research. Interesting. Three have not yet been contacted for a comment. One now denies having made the claim at all. Um, only three 
Menton, Morris, and Sharp, and I think this is the uh, Morris of the Creation Institute, I'm a research institute, and I could look back up and see which Morris it was. Um, I think it was Henry Morris, but I, my memory may fail me there. Have issued public corrections or clarifications. If I were in a group like this, I would want to have looked it over carefully, made sure that the guy's actually correct. Um, but the evidence that he has in the in the in the chapter is pretty convincing, and um, and I would want to be one of those that that issued public corrections or clarifications. Uh, and I'm going to say I again I I want to before I say for sure I want to actually look at the uh, the passage where. Uh, uh, that science and human origin cites to make sure that it does or does not say what uh, these people say it does. But uh, having done that, I think it would be a good thing to have a public statement of correction if that's the case. Uh, I'm inherently cautious and I've learned that you don't believe authority, you believe evidence. And I think that's true even here. The evidence is, you know, what people actually wrote in black and white at this point, because it's an allegation about what people have said, not what is actually true. Um, but uh, having said that, you, I think you need to go through uh, all of anything that you say and make it as clear as possible. And when you do make mistakes, I think you need to say it so upfront. Uh, and quickly and change everything that you write from then on. And sometimes even it's a good idea to put a historical note saying we used to believe this but the evidence here uh, convinces us otherwise. And in fact what might be done is to have some place on the web, since you can do this on the web, that you can simply refer people to who want more information that has the complete uh, evidence that you want to talk about. Anyway, so that's what's happening in chapter three. I think we have a bunch of mud and people are claiming they can see clearly through it. Um, and I think that uh, we can't see as clearly through it as we think we can, that some interpretations actually do kind of lend uh, the possibility of being able to divide between humans and apes in a more definitive manner than most people uh, in evolutionary biology want to, uh, and in anthropology. And um, I think that uh, it's possible that Luskin may have made a mistake, and, and uh, I'll be able to say a little more about that next week. Maybe if somebody's actually read the passage, we can get a comment this week on it. <laughs> and with that, um, well, I'll just. Um, um, I, I note go to from this comments. last argument that it is an issue of where somebody quoted somebody speaking something. R am I right? And the debunkers are saying that that has never been admitted to in print. Thus, is not legitimate. Um, and thus, it requires a withdrawal. Now, I wouldn't wish to somehow repeat what somebody, uh, somebody else has claimed that somebody told him something. That becomes hearsay, doesn't it? Well, in one important respect, it doesn't. And the reason that I say that is because um, in the law, once people say something, it disappears into thin air. And unless you have a videotape or an audio tape, there's no way of saying whether they really said that or not. And so it all becomes you know, uh, personal I mean. opinion. And people are we well known enough to remember things differently under pressure, uh, in some cases to flat out lie. 
and so the law tends to be very uh, tends to be very careful about having people say, "Well, he told me so and so," when you have absolutely no evidence for it. Now, if you can say, "My notes from such and such a time say," uh, then you have a little more of a case. If you happen to have an audio tape of it. Uh, then there's no argument at that point. So the law tends to be very, very careful about um, using hearsay evidence. But if you are saying that somebody said in print this, then people can go back and check if in print it actually says that. And that's the point at which you can be held accountable for your opinions if they are grossly biased or wrong. For example, how many people would believe that Dawkins would be willing to accept design provided it's some extraterrestrial who did it? Who is involved itself. That's right. Uh, just because, for example, I said, well, he told me personally. Uh, unless you actually had the video showing it. Nobody would ever believe that unless they had the video. But this is it. So what's the point of quoting something like this that, that's unverifiable? Well, that's, that's the thing. It, what you're actually looking at is people quoting mostly written statements. If you go yes. through Luskin's writings, um, I think that you will find two or three places where he says, uh, sta stated at such and such a time, and I have recordings. See? And that's, of course, where you can say, yes, he really did say that, and I can prove it. Um, but, I, you know, let's constrain well enough in the law to be able to know that you can't get. Uh, Hearsay evidence is weak. Uh, but here, print evidence isn't. Uh, is actually, we're going to pass one up here when you get done. So, uh, I mean, beyond that, um, it doesn't really matter because there's more osteopathicians than Lucy. So it really doesn't matter. They're all, they're all very similar. So we know that Johansson wasn't lying or deceitful or that the knee joint is significantly different than than Lucy's knee joint. We already know that. So there's no point in saying that the knee joint is found elsewhere because it doesn't matter. We have other, we have other specimens. That's, that's true. By the way, if I may ask the question, uh, have, has anybody looked at the, given the, the vestibular the, system yep. in australopithecus? Yes, yeah, and yes, Spore, Frederick Spore looked at the vestibular system and they were knuckle-walking apes and they also had the knuckle-walking uh, features of the hand, and that's why the knee joint doesn't, tree climbing chimps have the same knee joint that Lucy has, and everybody admits that. So it really makes no difference as far as the angle of the knee joint uh, versus tree, tree climbing chimps. And it yeah. doesn't and make any this is one of the things I think we need to be really careful about is to not uh, throw a whole bunch of, of uh, a smoke into the air. If it's, if it's murky, just say it's murky and move on rather than try to do a bunch of arguments about it. Bottom line, is there any use we can make of Lucy? What do we know about Lucy? Lucy, at least uh, to the knowledge that I have, uh, which I have to say like McBride, I don't know that much about it. Uh, I would say that uh, there's arguments over whether Lucy could walk upright. There is no argument that I know of as to whether Lucy's brain was big enough to reasonably qualify as prehuman, that it's pretty much ape. Well, I mean, even modern apes can walk upright. There's some apes that prefer to walk upright. And they're in zoos and you can they walk around upright. I have videos of them myself walking upright. I took a so class it's not, from one. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> It's not like they can't walk upright, it's just do they prefer to walk upright uh, or uh, as a species. And the semicircular canals say no, they prefer to walk in the prone posture.
So. So I don't know really why they're so. Why does Lucy still hang on? I mean, even some modern authors that publish in their own papers admit that sh that Australopithecines as a species were a knuckle walking ape, and that's recent uh, arguments. And so, why does she hang on? Besides that, it's the best that they have. Well, I think that that's part of the problem is that the, the evidence we have is inconclusive. And so you can argue in different ways. Uh, as a matter of fact, even for creationists, if Lucy were to turn out to be a half ape, half human, there are people who have been known to argue that, uh, that there were crosses between apes and humans. Well, there's, yeah, there's a big popular one not too long ago. I think he just died, a, uh, that walked upright and kind of had human-looking face, kind of a childlike face, and he was very popular in zoos. And they thought that he was a hybrid, perhaps, uh, before the genetic uh, studies came out. And turned out he was Turned out he was not a hybrid. He was just an ape from Congo that liked to walk upright. Yeah, so... Um, I'm not, I, I think that what we should be doing in this area is, uh, is approaching, the, approaching the evidence as objectively as we can, um, not worrying too much about where the chips fall, but if, if there aren't enough chips to fall in a nice evolutionary way, I don't think that we are obligated to say that they do. Um, I wonder if Sean could maybe enlighten us. Are there intermediate, uh, how should I say, orientations of the vestibular canals? Yeah. Or are there in, in only the fossil two? record, you mean? Yeah, in the fossil record. Yeah. I mean, are there something that, that's kind of halfway between? Oh, for goodness sakes. Um, There's a message in that. <laughs> <laughs> No, as far as Frederick Spohr has published, he's, he's done uh, semicircular canals on every skull that's available, and there seems to be a distinct dividing line that Homo erectus have the upright canal system, and everything that's uh, evolutionary below that has the prone canal system. Including Homo habilis. Yeah, including Homo habilis, which Homo habilis is like a, a, was, a, a tr wastebasket category because very different animals are classified as homo habilis, very different. And uh, so, Just lump them there. yeah, but they all have the, the ape uh, semicircular canals. But that's, a, that's an interesting point, is that, is that there does appear, at least in the semicircular canals, which is apparently the key to know what fossil whales look like, interestingly enough. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, is there, there is a difference between apes and humans, and I think Luskin mentions that in the, in the book. Uh, and that's worth something. Um, I don't know that it's worth everything, but I think that it's kind of important. The other thing that's interesting is that near as I can tell, the uh, australopithecines, the, the bones that I've seen, seem to have a grasping toe that comes out, a uh, great toe that comes out, uh, separated quite a bit. Uh, and the interesting thing of it is that the Laetoli footprints don't have it. And so if we are to believe the actual evidence, it looks like a, a human-type foot, which was not an Australopithecine foot as far as we can tell, goes back further in the fossil record. So it, it, that makes it harder to make the ape-to-human transition in, in a smooth way. Lucy's feet weren't discovered, but subsequent Australopithecines feet bones were discovered, and they have the ape toe, not not these modern footprints that were in the Laetoli uh, trackways in Africa. Those are modern human footprints. Um, I recall a comment once, and I'm not saying it's absolutely true, but that Leakey, when he uh, introduced uh, Homo habilis type had to stretch the definition of homo to get that into the homo genus, and which raises the question, does homo habilis really belong in the genus homo? 
Should it be Australopithecus uh, habilis or something like that? It, uh, but something else we, we might, uh, when, when there is this suggestion uh, that, for instance, Homo erectus, uh, that are lower down in the fossil record, have a smaller brain. To me, th th this is uh, significant and interesting data. It certainly favors evolution. But what we're not asking, and I think we need to ask, is the question of the dating of these things. Uh, some of these uh, datings we know have been very controversial, and uh, but we have not looked into that. Uh, it's not that striking. It doesn't, to me, significantly favor evolution in the Darwinian sense, as far as it favors evolution of uh, agriculture and and overall size. I mean, in my in our own lifetime, since you've been alive. Uh, People in South Korea, for example, have significantly increased in size over the last 60 years. They're the children of the very small parents, when I was there in the military, are much bigger and taller than the parents, and the grandparents, certainly. They have evolved. Bigger brains, bigger bodies, and everything. And they're like, what happened? Well, it's not, nothing genetic happened. It's just that their diet and agricultural change. The same is true, by so, the way, in Japan, where all the little houses are not big enough for the tall for the kids, tall that kids growing anymore. up in them. Right. So it's not really a genetic evolutionary change. It's just a difference in lifestyle. And uh, I think the similar thing happened in the fossil record. And also, Homo habilis was, was named Homo habilis, or handyman, because there were tools found with, the, with these bones. And so they said, well, these bones, actually, they, were, they used these tools. Uh, obviously, and so they're like pre-humans, and and some of the skulls uh, uh, of monkeys and stuff were butchered and stuff. And so the question, though, is um, were modern humans actually there using those tools and eating Homo habilis, which I think the little t the footprints uh, suggest pretty well. Well, there's been some claims that Peking man, to use the name that it was given before it became politically correct to call it Beijing. Um, Peking man actually turns out to be apes that were butchered as well. Yeah. And uh, so probably that's, a, you, have to, you have to take some of the uh, tool making. Because we know there were modern humans in the area at the time. We know that from the Latoli footprints. If you don't have the Bible or anything else to go with, you have to say, well, there were modern humans there at the time. Uh, so who's doing the butchering and who's making the tools? Yeah, so that's I mean, problem. what's the most rational conclusion, given that we know the Latoli footprints are there and that they're older? Anybody else have any comments? Otherwise, I'll just say um, next week I will get those um, uh, other two articles reviewed. I'll get the page on this one reviewed. And we'll have the uh, st stuff for you, and then we'll, in whatever time we have left, we'll start into uh, the critique of chapter four, which is, um, uh, I think, probably less significant than the critique of chapter three. And um, I will see you next week then.